Let's see what lessons we can learn about editing from this year's five best editing Oscar nominees, and then take a look at which one deserves to win. This video is sponsored by CuriosityStream. In The Trial of the Chicago 7, this character, Tom Hayden, is concerned about the way two other characters, Abby and Jerry, are behaving in court. This conflict is set up very briefly at the beginning of the first big courtroom scene. Whatever's going on between you and Abby, would you keep it out of this building? And it comes to a head in the next scene. Abby, you cannot talk back to the judge and Jerry! But even though this conflict is never mentioned verbally again throughout this scene, besides the quick mention at the beginning, it plays a crucial role throughout the entire scene. Are you familiar with contempt of court? It's practically a religion for me, sir. There are other arcs of conflict and drama in this particular scene, but this one plays an important role and is kept alive throughout the entire scene, entirely through editing with the use of well-placed reaction shots. Editing is about the relationship between images. The images you choose to put next to each other and when you choose to make the switch is one of the most powerful tools in film's toolbox for creating meaning. In this case, placing certain shots of Tom displaying certain emotions directly after what another character says or does creates in the audience the impression of a reaction. And we see meaning in that reaction, meaning that helps develop the conflict between the characters and that tells the story. If we move these reaction shots around and place them in other spots within the scene, we could tell an entirely different story. Seated at my table is my boss, U.S. Attorney Thomas Ferran, or I guess you could say I'm seated at his table creating different meanings and a different impression of the characters. Every cut places images into juxtaposition. These two shots create meaning in our minds because of the relationship we infer between their content, what's happening in each shot. But shots also relate to each other temporally, spatially, graphically, and rhythmically. The temporal relationship of two shots is how much time we perceive as having passed between them. Frequently, you want the temporal relationship between two shots to be continuous, like this cut from Promising Young Woman. Look, don't be mad, just I'll get the check. The audience is meant to perceive this cut as just a change in angle. There's no time that has passed between the two shots. The one is just a linear continuation of the other. But sometimes you want to use a cut specifically to indicate that time has passed. Oh. Honestly, I thought I'd be bored out of my skull watching the kids, but it's Great, actually. Here there's a clear temporal distance between the two shots. Instinctually, we just know time has passed because the type of alcohol they're drinking has changed and there's now food on the table where there wasn't before. These two shots and the cut between them places specific emphasis on the alcohol though, which is important to the story of the scene. But in addition to the temporal relationship, these two shots also have a graphic, spatial, and rhythmic relationship. Graphically, the two shots are pretty different. One is visually pretty simple, center framed, and has a human subject. And the other is a lot more visually complex while the subject is also framed to the left. These two shots also have a rhythmic relationship. This shot is static while the conversation is pretty slow and awkward, and this shot is dollying back fairly quickly, marking the increased pace in the conversation and the scene. Imagine for a moment if the editor, instead of cutting from here to here, had cut from this shot to this shot, one that is graphically, spatially, and rhythmically much more similar to the first shot. Technically, we could still tell that time had passed if we were paying very close attention and saw that the wine glass had changed, but most likely we'd be confused if this was the choice of cut for such a big temporal jump. We can see another example of a very similar jump in time in The Father. Here again, we go from a wide shot of the characters to a close-up shot of food on the table that is moving. You'll notice again that they're very different spatially, graphically, and rhythmically, and the focus of the shot on the transition, the chicken, is again important to the scene, like the alcohol. All of these big changes together help create a transition that makes the temporal jump between the two shots feel more natural. But here's where things get really complex, clever, and interesting when it comes to editing. Sometimes you want to confuse the audience. In this same scene in The Father, editor Yorgos Lampernos uses two very graphically similar shots to intentionally confuse us. At the start of the scene, we see this moment where Anthony walks in on a conversation. Believe me, the doctor is right. The moment will come when, however good she is, he's ill, man. 
He's ill. Dad, what are you doing standing out there? Come, come on. The scene progresses, they eat dinner, Anthony gets up and goes to the kitchen, he walks back, and we see this. He's ill, man. He's ill. Dad, what are you doing standing out there? Come, come and sit down. The scene feels like it's been progressing linearly, but then a moment of dialogue and action seems to repeat. Dad, what are you doing standing out there? Come, come on. Dad, what are you doing standing out there? Come, come and sit down. It's leaving us confused about what's happening and when it really happened. Graphically, rhythmically, and spatially, we feel like this should be the same moment, but temporally, it doesn't make sense. It shows the audience directly what Anthony's experience of dementia might feel like for him. You might have noticed that I'm now talking about the relationship between two shots that aren't directly beside each other in the film. They're spread out on either end of a scene. But that's another layer of the beauty and complexity we find in editing, that the relationship of two shots can create meaning even when they're spread out and not connected directly through a cut. The Sound of Metal uses the graphic relationship between two shots spread out over the entire film to create meaning. First shot of the film is Ruben sitting at a drum set, not speaking. I'm not going to show you the other shot in this relationship because it would spoil the film, but think about that. Just showing these two shots side by side would be a spoiler for the film. That's how much information is conveyed just in the relationship of these two images. Creating a strong graphic or rhythmic callback to another earlier shot highlights a moment in our minds and we focus in on what's going on in that moment. The graphical relationship between multiple shots spread out across a film can also help create a sense of rhythm. In The Sound of Metal, using this specific shot, twice to establish the morning after a concert creates a rhythm that helps us understand that this is the character's routine. We then feel the disruption to this rhythm as the character's lives begin to change and conflict is introduced into the story. The same technique is used in Nomadland. In the first act, there are several very similar tracking shots following Fern as she's walking. Roughly the same amount of time passes between each of these shots and it helps create a rhythm that again is disrupted as the story begins to progress. Editing is essentially a series of decisions about what relationships you want to create between shots. Each decision creates meaning that helps tell the story. So how for a best editing Oscar do we even begin to judge which editor is making the best decisions for their film? Critical to the sound of metal working is its ability to place us inside the subjective perspective of the main character as he begins to lose his hearing. I already talked about in another video how sound design was used to create that perspective audibly, but the editing plays a massive role in making the transitions between limited hearing and a full range of hearing feel natural and make sense to the audience. Take for example this scene where the audio moves from Ruben's limited hearing to a full range of hearing. The movement between these two perspectives doesn't just happen, it's cued by a cut. This cut is timed with a sound within the environment, and the transition both visually and audibly between perspectives feels seamless. The same thing happens here in this scene. He's having trouble even communicating with me. It is Wider shots like this, which show us more of the world around Ruben, are usually linked to a perspective of full hearing, while more subjective shots like this that are more close up, contained, and focus on Ruben himself are generally linked in the film to Ruben's subjective experience audibly. The editor is using a big change between the shots graphically and spatially to cue a big change between the shots audibly. You're not going to hear a blender generally if you're not showing one on screen. So to some extent, the editor is choosing and arranging what sounds are going to happen where. The editor has to be thinking not just about the visual relationship between two shots, but also about the sonic relationship that might exist between the two shots once the sound design is finished. 
To avoid spoilers, I can't really talk about some of the best edited scenes in this film, but there are so many moments where the character's emotions aren't conveyed through dialogue. It's the performances combined with the rhythm of the editing and the choice and the progression of shots that creates the emotion and some of the most significant moments in this film. The Trial of the Chicago 7 is acclaimed writer Aaron Sorkin's second foray into directing. And his direction is fine, but nothing about his direction seems to have the same unique voice that he has as a writer. Except maybe, in this film, the editing. Look at how Sorkin is writing these lines of dialogue. No place to be right now, but in it. But fry the pigs? If they Dr. attack, King. he's dead. There's an overlap. One line is a continuation of the other. Now Sorkin can do that not just in the script and in an individual piece of dialogue, but between scenes. If we're met there with violence, you better believe that we're going to meet that violence with nonviolence. Always nonviolence, and that's without exception. Chicago 7 is a film that really trusts its audience to just comprehend its narrative. It moves quickly between ideas, scenes, flashbacks, and the film's present without doing much hand holding for the audience. And this allows a lot of freedom stylistically within the edit to maintain a pace that matches Sorkin's dialogue. Take a look at this moment where we jump from what's being talked about on the witness stand to a flashback of that event. Did you have a meeting on that day? Yes. Uh, with whom? Mr. Hoffman and Mr. Rubin, is it? Abby and Jerry's fine. And what was said at that meeting? Here there's a jump spatially, temporally, and graphically, and there is no establishing shot to orient the audience or even a moment of transition to show us we're in a different place. Instead, we're left to infer what we're seeing from the dialogue. The clear rhythm of the edit here is what carries things through. Just look at how the rhythm of the edit and the dialogue are working together through this moment to carry us out of the courtroom into the flashback and back into the courtroom. They also said that there would be public fornication. Say that again, sir. Public fornication. You're, you're asking for a parks permit for public yeah, fornication. Yeah, and rock music. No, of course not. What if it was R and B? Did you issue the permits? No. I did not. Once the film establishes this pattern, it gets even more complicated, cutting between multiple versions of the flashback and the courtroom scene seamlessly. It's a pretty impressive feat, and these choices move us deftly and quickly through a complicated story with a lot of different moving pieces, all while keeping up with the breakneck clip of Sorkin's dialogue. Is there anybody there? If The Trial of the Chicago 7 trusts its audience with its narrative, the father places immense faith in its audience. The Father is a 97-minute film that feels much longer. It has a narrative that often leaves you confused about what's really happening, but this is entirely intentional. Everything all right? Who are you? Sorry? Who are you? The film is attempting to put you inside the experience of a man with dementia. It does this by carefully managing and manipulating the information that the audience has access to, with most of what's really going on in the larger plot merely hinted at. Your husband. Who? Hmm? Your husband. What husband? This is a delicate balance. Too much confusion and the audience could get annoyed or frustrated and not enough and the film's concept doesn't sell as hard and the story doesn't have as much impact. Look at how this scene withholds information from us with a well-placed cut. Anne, you're going to have to what? while simultaneously emphasizing the importance of the information we don't get to hear with the same cut. There are two elements of this film that are very important, the passage of time and the location as a character. And editor Yorgos Lampernos deftly manages both of these elements in the edit. He uses a rhythm of editing and pattern of shots to establish both the location and to show that time is passing. The payoff here I can't talk about because it spoiled the film, but it's powerful, and it wouldn't be as effective if those moments weren't as precisely edited. The editing here is quite masterful and subtle in a way that I think is a little unusual for an Academy Best Editing nomination. Sometimes a restrained but precise hand is better than a bold and stylistic approach to editing. 
Speaking of bold and stylistic approaches, Promising Young Woman has a very specific energy and tone that is important to the story. The, first time. the energy and the tone aren't just stylistic elements, they're critical to what the film is trying to say. Quantifying a film's energy and tone and where it comes from is difficult to do. Here the set design performances, camera movement, sound, music, and most importantly for us, editing all work together to create this energy. Pacing is maybe one of the most important elements of energy in a film, and pacing is primarily controlled by editing. Look at how the rhythm of the music and the edit works together to seamlessly transition us between three locations. Sometimes it's the lead-in of the dialogue carrying us into the next scene without dropping the pace. You know, I was talking to Graham earlier, and he says- And sometimes it's even the fully and the sound design making the cuts feel more abrupt. signifying not just a change in location or scene, but a more significant change in the character or the story. Yet again, some of the most significant editing choices are in spoiler territory here, but I can say that sometimes the choice of when not to cut is the most important choice an editor can make. And if you've seen this film, you probably know what I'm talking about. Nomadland stands apart from the other nominees this year for a specific reason. Writer and director Chloe Zhao was also the editor of the film. Zhao has talked about how she thinks about the editing in the writing and shooting process. Doing all three of these things herself allows the editing to truly start in the screenplay and the writing to end in the edit. And while this is true of almost every film, the fact that she is directly doing all three gives her a unilateral control, and you can see that come through in the final product. Zhao's work is stylistically linked to Terrence Malick's. Oh, yeah! Oh, <laughs> Oh, a, ooh, that's almost a whole bag of Doritos. And his more freeform, impressionistic style of editing has clearly been an influence. That style isn't just something that happens in the editing bay, it's a style that's grounded in a unique approach to both production and editing. You'll notice that a lot of what I talked about at the beginning of the video doesn't really apply here in the same way. There are big jumps in time within a scene without it being clearly marked. Take a look at this scene, which is composed out of just four shots, each of which jump pretty far in time. Editing like this, where the relationship between shots spatially and temporally is a lot looser, is a technique that sometimes we call montage. We often think of a montage as a quick succession of images that skip through time with music playing underneath. But Nomadland, following in the tradition of Malik and some other filmmakers, kind of blurs the lines between montage editing and more traditional styles of editing. Here's an example. It's called wet and dry. Mm -hmm. We need it to be wet. Ready? And then we need to mask the fender off because the white paint will land on the fender too. Put plastic over this. You can see in this scene that there are big jumps in time that aren't really meant to be covered over. They're pretty noticeable. But this also isn't like a traditional montage. There's dialogue, there's no music, and even though we're jumping forward in time with different cuts, the scene doesn't actually cover that much time in total. Editing like this is a very different approach. There are less rules and it requires a strong just intuition for what is going to work. There's a beauty and a power to create meaning in this type of editing that draws people like Malik and Zhao to this style for the types of stories they want to tell. I think this is certainly the most uniquely edited film out of this group of nominees, and it really showcases what's possible when you edit in a more free and unconventional way. So who deserves to win Best Editing out of this group of nominees? 
I think it's a tough choice this year. None of these films are poorly edited. If I have a critique of any of them, I think The Trial of the Chicago 7, while it's well edited, maintains a breakneck pace almost too much. I wanted more breaks and more variety in the pacing and the rhythm there. I wouldn't really be upset if any of the other films won Best Editing, but who would I personally choose as the winner? One of the biggest deciding factors for me is finding a film that isn't just using editing to help tell the story that's on screen and in the dialogue, but a film that is truly telling important parts of its story with the editing itself. For that, it's almost a toss-up between Nomadland and The Sound of Metal. In both of these films, there are moments where dialogue takes a back seat and the significant emotion is conveyed through well-timed cuts at very critical points in the story. Personally, I think I'd choose The Sound of Metal for the win, but I'd be very happy if Nomadland got it as well. What do you think? Which of these nominees uses the relationship between images to tell its story best? When I edit videos for YouTube, unfortunately, I can't just focus on which images will best convey what I'm trying to say. Instead, I have to think about what will avoid a wrongful copyright claim or what will help the algorithm promote my video. In almost all my videos, the version you finally watch on YouTube isn't my original cut. It's a version that's gone through several revisions to make it more YouTube friendly. It's kind of like having a robot producer looking over your shoulder in the editing bay. That's why I'm excited to tell you about Nebula, where I don't have to worry about those things things and where you can watch the original extended director's cut of this video. Nebula is a streaming service created by myself and a bunch of other great creators, including other great video essayists like Lessons from a Screenplay, Patrick Willems, and Like Stories of Old, so we can put our video somewhere without having ads and without having YouTube looking over our shoulder. On Nebula, instead of listening to this ad, you could be listening to the big long tangent about why the Trial of the Chicago 7 score is terrible that I had to cut out of the video. But what does any of this have to do with Curiosity Stream? Well, Curiosity Stream has partnered with us to provide Nebula for free when you sign up for Curiosity Stream. Curiosity Stream gives you access to fantastic educational documentaries covering a ton of topics. I recommend Obit, which is about the obituary writers at the New York Times. You can get access to that, the extended version of this video, and everything else on Curiosity Stream and Nebula for 26% off the annual plan when you use the link in my description. It's less than $15 a year. You get access to all of Curiosity Stream and Nebula, all while supporting my work and the work of other independent content creators. So click the link in the description to sign up or go to curiositystream.com slash Thomas Flight. Using that link helps support my work and gets you access to more content like this ad-free.